Hi, and welcome to the Retail Innovation Pitch Event, brought to you by our presenting sponsor, Don Humby, Cart and Winsight Grocery Business. Our supporting sponsors for today's event are Curbside and Shop to Cook. My name is Kaylee Bogdan, and I'm Winsight Grocery Business's Director of Content Marketing. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to go through a couple of quick housekeeping items for you guys. Throughout our presentation, we encourage you to interact with our speakers by typing in questions uh, using the Q&A widget on your screen. You can ask a question at any time, but we'll hold all of the questions and answer them live at the end of the presentation. You can also customize your window by moving and resizing the widgets on your screen. Um, and of course, if you're experiencing any technical issues, just use the help button at the bottom right of your screen to get in touch with us. Uh, we're also recording today's session and we'll email you as soon as that's available. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to our moderator to kick things off. Take it away, Sterling. Hey, everybody. And welcome again to the Spring 2018 CART Pitch Event. Uh, this is the first time we've done a program like this publicly, and it's really great to be with the hundreds of you guys that have logged on with us. You know, we're here to hear from some of the greatest new companies coming into retail, right? Emerging technology isn't just this possibility anymore. We're in a world today where it's becoming almost necessary. And it's super exciting because what it means to be a retailer is starting to shift right before our eyes, and we're going to see some of that today. Now, here's how today is going to go. I'm going to talk briefly about that shift and kind of set the stage for our conversation. I'm then going to take a minute to introduce our panelists and sponsors that make all this possible before getting right into the pitches that I know everybody's waiting for. And then, as Kaylee mentioned, we'll have some time for Q&A, and we're going to do it all in less than an hour. So what it means to be a retailer has looked the same for a really long time, right? And we're all very comfortable with that. We're all very comfortable with retailers or us as an industry driving decisions where we're choosing to embrace innovation or not in embrace innovation. And we've done it over a lot of years. I mean, the advent of self-shopping somewhere around the 1940s they had this incredible innovation at the time, but hey, instead of having all service retail, let's make it self-service. Let's have customers come in and take the products off the shelf themselves. And right then, modern retailing's born, and we've had similar breakthroughs since then, all on the same premise, but using different technologies like scanning in the 70s, self-checkout early 90s, loyalty programs mid-90s, right? And there were a bunch of others, but the point is that they're all retailer-led or industry-led initiatives. Now, today, as we all know, it's a little bit different story. Because today, consumers are holding the power in the supply chain. And it started somewhere with the iPhone or around the iPhone and has really grown from there, where we now see consumers taking the position of things like, well, I'm on mobile, or I want one-hour delivery. If you want to reach me, you need to have that available. You need to be where I want you to be when I want you to be there. And it's literally opened the floodgates because retail isn't just retail as we've known it anymore. We've got companies like Amazon and thousands of different startups coming out of left field, changing what it means to be a retailer, and they're doing it by using technology and really catering to where the customer is, or maybe better said, where it's easier for the customer to be. Now, while all of that's available today, retail still hasn't taken that fundamental leap as an industry, right? And that's part of the reason we're all here. A lot of the decisions we tend to make tend to be very incremental, right? And a couple of stats here, and I many of you guys are probably familiar with some of these things, right, where 26% of retailers plan to add data analytics to make better buying decisions, right? A quarter of people think that's a good thing to do, and everyone's got a smartphone, or almost everybody's got a smartphone, and only about half of retailers are meeting them there. And why? Well, as an industry, we're stuck spending about 80% of our tech budget just maintaining what we already have, and it's not all our fault, right? We're built this way, and humans tend to have a hard time with 
exponential functions. And it, a great quote by a University of Colorado professor, um, he said that the greatest shortcoming of the human race, of all humanity, is our inability to understand the exponential function. And while we know technology is growing at this exponential rate, right, it's difficult to understand that and actually apply it to everyday business. And all these emerging technologies, some of which we'll be talking about today, drones, robots, AI, and so on, are advancing at a rate that's almost incomprehensible to us. And that's part of the reason it's so exciting. Now, here's, here's what we're looking at, and here's what we're going to do today. When we combine kind of the linear trajectory that most of retail is on with what's technologically possible, it opens up this gap, the innovation gap. And it's in this gap that we're going to step together today. This is the opportunity. This is the space where we really get to look at the business and understand not just what can we do a little better, but what can we actually do differently. So here we go. Um, making this all possible, of course, are our sponsors. And the whole thing is presented by Dunhumby. And while you've probably heard a little of Dunhumby, you probably don't know the latest, that they've developed a customer data science that empowers businesses everywhere. And I also want to thank our supporting sponsors, shop to cook the one-stop shop for customer-facing digital tech, and Curbside. These guys are powering the future of Omnichannel and already helping retailers like CVS and HEB fulfill on millions of online order pick up in store programs. Now, if you don't know these guys, you definitely should. And a big thank you to all of them for their participation. And of course, our retail and wholesale partners and panelists make this whole thing real, right? They ground it in the operations of what's actually happening. And they've supported with the finalist selection, the four finalists of the program you'll hear from today. And they're all on today and will be listening in to make their final evaluations. And I'd like to take just a moment here to hear from one of our panelists and sponsors, senior customer strategist from Dunhumby, David Jonjo. David. Hey, thank you, Sterling, and thanks to everybody for joining the call. We at Dunhumby are very grateful for the opportunity to participate and to be presenting sponsors of all of this because innovation is really at the core of our DNA. The name Dunhumby, by the way, is the found, is a surname of the two founders who literally innovated this idea of customer science in a back bedroom of their home. And they're a married couple, of course. Um, and at Dunhumby, we think of ourselves as both entrepreneurial and global. Global means that we understand people. We understand customers, consumers at scale. This idea of a customer science platform is about science, it's about technology, it's about consulting, uh, it's about frameworks and so forth that really enable retailers to truly engage in a one-to-one -one kind of a conversation. You'll see the numbers on the right when I talk at uh, what it means to be at scale. But another number that doesn't show up is that Dunhumby understands, together with the retail partners you see here, about 800 million households across the world on this very granular kind of basis. In fact, back to the innovation, it was Dunhumby who invented that big data for high transaction volume retail um, and then invented some of the tools and solutions and software to enable retailers to make quick decisions. So Dunhumby thinks beyond just CRM and the loyalty cards. And by the way, I know, Sterling, I appreciate that when you showed the uh, history of, of retail a little bit, you had a Kroger Plus card there. Ron Bonacci and I appreciate that very much uh, because we were involved in that, but, but thanks. Um, and I was talking about then now uh, beyond CRM to all aspects of what we would think about as the hard wiring of retail. If you start sort of clockwise in the upper left of this little diagram, understanding customers at scale means really getting into the DNA of how 
consumers shop, what their preferences are, what their trip missions are. It's about creating a language, if you will, about customers and consumers in a business. So it's the science that underlines that, the segmentation approaches and the language, as I said. The next bit of hardwiring is traditional category management or category optimization. And so we provide, again, framework and tools and consulting to help uh, retailers in many classes of trade, many verticals, really, really know how customers use the store, how they use categories, and how customers balance their baskets around that store. Moving again clockwise to customer engagement, that might be defined as more of your typical one-to-one -one or your CRM. Nowadays, though, it includes, of course, mobile, digital, e-commerce, and so forth. I should note on these two in category optimization and in customer engagement that Dunhamby is a partnership and a, and a partnering kind of organization. We like to apply our science into the JDA tools, for example, the supply chain tools, the science into the uh, nutritional attributes that a company like Spin does on the customer engagement. So. One reason why we will be listening to innovations is to look for opportunities to partner, look for opportunities for customer science to be part of a world-class kind of a solution. Um, we, too, ourselves started out in probably internally led innovations, as Sterling said, and now are looking externally because the pace of change has, has accelerated so much. Let's continue around clockwise. Price and promotion is a core competency, a core capability. The Dunhamby USP is about using the customer science to inform these decisions. It's a very different list, for example, when you consider the customer metrics and science than volumetric metrics in doing um, the right kind of strategic pricing. In the middle of all of this is the Dunhamby ethos that everything starts with a customer. Everything about the customer starts with the data. So we're also in the data strategy business to help organizations really bring together all their assets to make some sense. So that's the quick uh, high-level flyover of who Dunhamby is. Uh, just remember, again, the customer science platform to understand and delight customers at scale. And I think you'll know a bit more about what we do. So I'll hand it back to you, Sterling, if you don't mind, um, to talk about the next groups. Great. Thank you, David. Now, into the main event. So coming from an evaluation of over 250 applications, We've narrowed down this list of finalists to literally the latest and greatest. And it's no small feat. There are all sorts of technologies from all over the world, and these are the top four that we've looked at. And they've been evaluated across a set of 10 criteria, including uh, market viability, the problem their solution solves, who's on their team, and they'll be presenting for all of us as well as the panelists today. Now, keep any questions you have and type them into the Q&A box you should have there, and we'll address all of them at the end. Okay, so we'll go through all four of the pitches and then circle back for any questions for any of our presenters here at the end. Now, first up, we've all heard about autonomous vehicles. We've all heard about electric vehicles. Some of us have probably seen them out on the streets, and now there's one specifically for grocery delivery. And it totally changes the economics, and it's already out here in market. So first up is Adria Lubarski, VP Director of Business Development at UDELF, presenting first. Adria. Thanks, Sterling. Uh, and hello, everybody. My name is Adria, and I want to start this off with a very, very obvious statement, and that is that the future is going to be remarkable. And many of the things that the future are going to bring, it seems, are still many years away. Uh, but at UDEL, we did not accept that as gospel. So what we did is we took a look at one industry of the future, self-driving cars, and we created a strategy to bring them to market years ahead of plan. UDEL is the world's first autonomous delivery vehicle. We are live and on the roads. We are more than science fiction. We are doing deliveries for multiple customers, and we are preparing to shape the future of transportation through delivery. And there's a lot of problems here that need to be addressed. 
The big one is we've only seen the tip of the iceberg in e-commerce. Many of you might see this graph here reflected in your own businesses. E-commerce is growing at a huge pace, while brick and mortar pales in comparison to that. Online grocery sales were $14 billion in 2017, and they're expected to double in just four years to $30 billion in 2021. So this is reflected in what's happening in e-commerce as a whole. Uh, about 9% of all purchases in 2017 were made online. 9%. You probably get everything online, but that's only 9% of all things, and that is going to triple in the next decade. So if it takes 6 million delivery vehicles to do just 9% of orders, how many can we possibly have once that triples to over 25, 30% of all orders? You can't solve this with just putting more cars on the road. You're going to need something more creative, like an autonomous delivery vehicle, and that's for a number of reasons. The first is simple environmentalism. Cars and trucks are America's biggest climate problem, and just putting more traditional cars on the road doing one or two deliveries at a time is only going to exacerbate that. But autonomous delivery vehicles can solve that. The other is safety. In the U.S. alone, there's 40,000 motor vehicle fatalities uh, every single year, well over a million around the world. And this tragic number hardly touches the associated costs that come of maintaining and repairing vehicles after accidents. But autonomous vehicles can solve that. And the last of many is customer service. Most people prefer to get their packages and groceries delivered to places other than the home. Many are expected to or desire the opportunity to reschedule delivery en route because they might not be there to accept it. They don't want their milk or chicken sitting out on their porch all day. And regular vehicles can't, simply can't provide that level of service. But autonomous vehicles can solve that. And so the solution to all this is not more vehicles on the road that are traditional Ford Tauruses and, <laughs> and Sonatas just hanging out, driving a couple orders at a time. The solution is Udell, an autonomous vehicle built for delivery. Autonomous vehicles are going to change a lot about what it means to be a delivery company or a company even doing delivery. With better logistics, which means smaller delivery windows and improved order tracking, customers are happier and you know exactly where your order is at any time. Uh, they are more reliable. Got pushed back for a second. Uh, they're more reliable, which means you don't have to hire nearly as many drivers or employees, but the ones you do will be better. And you minimize accidents and repairs because autonomous vehicles know the laws. They don't get into accidents nearly as much as regular vehicles. So that makes it considerably cheaper. And with very high volume and a ton of customer convenience at the very focus of what we do, well, that improves the customer service to a level that your business can compete against the very, very biggest ones in the world. Now, the way they work is a lot like the human brain works. They zap out LIDAR, which is laser beams and radar, and just taking the world around them. Uh, they crunch the data, and they make decisions, which is a lot like a human driver. Except while we are also thinking about a fight we had with our spouse or a busy day at work or what we're going to have for lunch, vehicles just do their job. They take Autonomous vehicles, rather, do their job. They take in data, and they drive, which makes them considerably safer. Now, the UDEL Vehicle 1 uh, drives about 25 miles an hour, can do well over 60 orders a day, and has 18 compartments. And Vehicle 2, which will be released in September, is going to be considerably better than that. We're always making improvements. Now, the real value of what we do comes in the cargo space. The cargo space can be totally customized to your business. So while we were built for groceries at first, and a way to keep the cold chain, and like we'll talk about in a second, this vehicle can be... Uh, the cargo space can be grown if you have really high volume orders, or it can be taller if you use paper bags, shorter if you use plastic bags. If you are doing less groceries and more uh, auto parts, like some of our current customers, well, then you need more compartments with smaller areas, and so that can all be customized. Now, for many of you here, which are in the grocery industry, or the grocery part of retail, keeping the cold chain is probably the first question on your mind. And since we were built for grocery, we've done a lot of research about this. What we went with is an aluminum insulation, the passive honeycomb insulation. That, as you can see on this chart here, following the green line on the very bottom, keeps things at a very consistent cold temperature for well over three hours and a lot longer with ice packs, which is much more than you really need uh, for your standard delivery cycle. Now, the way this works is very simple. The vehicle arrives at your grocery store. You open up an app that has all your orders. You click an order, load it in the vehicle click the next order, load in the vehicle. And we've actually uh, shortened the time it takes to load from 60 seconds in order when we started 
to actually under 15 seconds in order. So this happens very, very quickly. And this is all tied to the customer app. Apartment start signs, so when I walk outside to get my order, all I do is click open in my app, proper compartment opens, and I retrieve my order. Now, we are also making this a lot easier. For example, we thought, well, why do customers even want to download an app? Why can't we make it simpler? So just last week, we enabled a text to open, where when you get a text message saying, hi, your order is outside, you walk outside, you reply one, and the proper thing opens. No apps, no complicated taps, super, super simple. And this leads us to our very most important differentiation. We're live and on the road. This is a photo taken on our launch date, January 30th, 2018. You can see the driver doesn't have his hands on the wheel. The car is in full autonomy. So there's two parts to this business. There's the autonomous driving, which is a huge challenge and we're working on, and one of the best in the world. And there's the challenge of deliveries. And this is what becomes interesting for you. You have the first company to be doing hundreds of deliveries in multiple industries. We started with groceries in your business. We've done auto parts and hot food and flowers, and every single industry we do teaches us more about how to store, move, open, load, unload compartments in an autonomous delivery vehicle future. So much of this knowledge is something that we want to begin to pass over to you. Compared to competition, we're focused on two really important things. The traction is the first one. We're the first to do as many deliveries that we've done on public roads. We're the first to do it in multiple industries, as most are focused on restaurants and hot food. And we're the first to do it at a high volume. You might have seen many sidewalk robots that go at a couple miles an hour on sidewalks carrying one or two deliveries. And that has value, perhaps if you're delivering on a campus or a really short distance. But think about your own businesses. You need to put a lot of volume in one, or, in one vehicle in order to make costs work. And UW is the first to be able to do that. Now, the team putting this together is really important because if you're going to put your faith in something like autonomous vehicles, you need to make sure uh, that the team is well motivated and they're the right people to do it. Daniel Laurie is our CEO, a repeat entrepreneur, and he finds really big opportunities and finds ways to make sure they get to market quickly. And he's done that over and over again in his long career. AK Patel is our CTO who started at Apple and Tesla on their self-driving car projects, so some of the biggest self-driving car companies in the world. And he found a way through UDEL to bring this technology to market much faster through deliveries than through ride sharing and, and things like Uber. My name is Adriel, and I've been an entrepreneur a number of times over, an investor, and I'm here in this industry because of a number of personal accidents that happened in vehicles that could have entirely been avoided for self-driving cars. And many of you might have something similar like that in your lives. So these vehicles, again, are on the road, and we have customers now, and we're looking for more. And this is something that can help your business immediately. Your insurance is lowered because you don't have to use your vehicles. You're using ours. No more consistency in your drivers or expensive vehicle upkeep. And we do everything at cost. So your cost, as long as you're doing a certain number of deliveries, do not increase at all while running this, but your knowledge will rocket. You'll get a lot of local press, and this implementation happens quickly. In less than a couple of months, you can have a vehicle on the road for your business with a cargo space that works for you, and our safety driver allows us to launch in any state. There's over 32 states that allow self-driving cars regulatorily, but if your business is one of the states that are still on the fence, we can still launch there because the autonomous delivery experience is really where the education happens, and our safety driver will take care of the driving. And most importantly, this will allow your business to prepare for the future. You'll be able to co-design a vehicle that works for your business. You'll be able to be the first to understand how to cut costs well below what they are now. And you'll be an industry leader. So today, we're reinventing deliveries and encouraging businesses like yours to start the conversation about what autonomous vehicles can mean for your delivery business today and in the future. So thank you very much. Unreal. Thank you. It was awesome. I can't wait to see one of these things on the road. It's only a matter of time, right? Uh, they're already on there. Come visit us in California. Awesome. So next up, we've all heard about computer vision, right? And using computer vision to manage out of stocks, right? How can you understand what products are there and not there just through camera data? And we've also heard a lot about digital screens and advertising for a long time. Well, this next company has both. Let's welcome Marlo Nickel, CEO of PopSpots. Marlo. Hey, thanks, Sterling. 
Um, so before I start, I just want to take a moment to thank everyone on the call for joining. Um, I'm well aware the grocery never stops, you know, even for the holidays. So I really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to me. I um, also want to thank everyone at CART for putting this together. Right now, you know, innovation is more important than ever for retail, and CART's playing a huge role in pushing this forward. So with that said, um, I'll go ahead and get started. As Sterling said, my name is Marla Nickel. I'm the CEO of PopSpots. And I'm talking to you today from Austin, Texas. And to help explain what we do at PopSpots, I want to play a quick game. It's a bit like Where's Waldo, but a hell of a lot easier. I call it Where Are the Products? So the pictures I'm going to show you are from checkout aisles in grocery stores across America. Some of these operators, they only own one store. But some of them, they own hundreds. You know, some of these stores, they, they have two checkout aisles. And some of these stores have dozens. Some have higher than average margins, and others are closer to the norm. But they all have one thing in common, and that's that they're losing millions of dollars every year because the products simply aren't in stock. And this may seem simple. <laughs> it might even seem mundane to some of the sexier startups in Silicon Valley. But out-of-stock products are a major problem in our industry, which brings me to what we do at PopSpots. At PopSpots, we solve real business problems like out-of-stock products with technology that you can use today. You know, this last part, the fact that you can use this technology right now in your store, that's what's really important because there are dozens of companies out there that are trying to address the out-of-stock problem, but the reality is that their solutions are often too expensive or impractical to work in real stores like yours. The reason that we're different is because of our team. Like any good tech startup, we're stacked with brilliant hardware and software engineers, but we also have two individuals that truly know grocery. Without Crest and Lance Elke, Pop Spots will be dead on arrival. Lance Elke has been in grocery for his entire career, and the two of them together, uh, looks like I jumped back here. Um, so the two of them have been in grocery for over a decade, running a business that manufactures front end fixtures for many of you, including AWG, Certco, CNS, SuperValue, and dozens more. And the space they play in, the checkout aisle, it might seem like small potatoes, but every one of your customers passes through it, and every year they spend six and a half billion dollars buying products that have some of the best margins in your store. So two years ago, Lance and Crest got together and they realized that for all the time and effort spent designing and manufacturing front-end merchandisers, no one was addressing the core operational problems that plague the space. You can perfect your planogram all you want, but if you're not monitoring out-of-stock products or planogram compliance, you are wasting your time. So Lance and Crest found some young tech nerds like myself, and together we built the next generation of front-end merchandisers, what we call smart racks. And the screens that you see on top of these displays, or on top of these fixtures, they're actually mini computers. And in each one, we've embedded the sensors and processors necessary to prevent out-of-stocks, ensure planogram compliance, and reduce dated products. Um, so, uh, in addition to that, they can also create for you, like Sterling mentioned, an entirely new pure profit revenue stream from ad sales. Um, but I'll leave that piece for Q&A, and I want to keep our focus on the out-of-stock problem. We've talked about how out-of-stocks are, how much they're costing the industry, but I want to talk about how much they're costing you. If you look at this slide here, um, it gives you a really simple way to approximate your losses. Take the number of stores you have, in this case we'll use 200, Multiply it by the front end sales per store, which is typically around $200,000, and divide the result by 10. The result that you get is the losses that you have every year in your front end, for an estimated amount. For our 200 store chain here, the result gives you 4 million. And that sounds crazy, like a, just a huge number, but if you don't believe me, just look at the picture that's on this slide. It's taken from an excellent retailer with above average margins and over 200 stores. And after we audited their chain, we found that their out-of-stocks were costing them far more than the $4 million that we originally estimated. So how do we actually solve this problem? With the smart devices that you saw earlier, we can take pictures of your front end. We take those images and we process them with algorithms that we train to understand your specific planograms for every store and lane. And then any out-of-stock or planogram issues that we identify, those are compiled into a really simple report that we email out to your store managers. They can print it out, take it on the floor, and actually fix their issues. And then here's the really fun part. The system automatically follows up to confirm that those issues are resolved. 
In addition to that, we give you unprecedented oversight into your entire retail chain. So you can see from our web dashboards how your stores are ranked, which ones are doing the best, which ones are doing the worst. And you can actually go out to the ones that are performing well and share their best practices with the ones that are struggling. You can also, of course, see how they improve over time. Now, the grocers that are adopting StockCheck are seeing incredible results. For every 10% reduction in out-of-stocks, we're seeing sales increase by 3%, which is great, but that begs the question, how quickly can you do this? Um, in one particular grocer that had a 19% out-of-stock rate, which is pretty bad, we were able to cut their issues in half in just over 30 days. So at this point, the two questions I most often get are, you know, is this actually going to work in my store, and is it affordable? And the answer to both those questions is yes, because even though we launched just last fall, we we're already in hundreds of stores across the country. We serve big grocers, small grocers, and over the next six months, we're going to be serving hundreds more of them. Plus, let's work in their stores, and we know it will work in yours, because we build technology that you can use today. Now, I'd love to share more about the other problems in, in grocery that we're solving. Um, so if you'd like to hear more, just send me an email, and I'm happy to come out and meet you in person. Thank you. Great, Marlon. Thanks very much. Exciting stuff. Now, 3D printing is something that's had a lot of hype around it for years, right? And there's a lot of questions around it. How does it work? Where does it fit? How, do, how does it come into retail, especially fast-moving consumer goods retail? Well, originally funded by NASA Research, this next company may have figured that out. Uh, I'd like to welcome Ben Feltner, COO at BHAX. Ben. Great. Thank you, Sterling. All right. Imagine a retail grocery experience in which you enter the bakery department and are greeted with a smile from a knowledgeable expert. Your questions would be answered, recommendations made, and special offers or new products shared. All of this is possible without increasing your monthly costs through fresh food automation. Let the machines do the work while the employees enhance customer experience and satisfaction. As Sterling said, BHEX is a NASA spinoff uh, company that specializes in 3D food printing and robotics. We focus on precise food deposition, and our mission is to personalize the future of food. In-store bakery departments are experiencing a workforce problem. At lower wages, grocery stores deal with employee turnover issues, low customer engagement, employees with multiple tasks and no specialty, and quality and reliability issues. Several of our current customers worked for in-store bakeries and left to start their own company. Our 3D dessert decorator is a dynamic multi-use fresh food automation machine. Oh. Sorry, having trouble. Hold on. Okay, our 3D dessert decorator is a, a dynamic multi-use fresh food automation machine. Now, the machine replicates hand piping techniques through 3D printing and extrusion technology. The entire machine was designed and built from the ground up by our team. It includes easy-to-use software, a vision system for printing on top of baked goods such as cakes and cookies, and a clean-in-place system, and disposable frosting pouches are utilized for easy operation. To give you an idea of how our dessert decorator works, let's take a look at a short video. As I mentioned, our 3D food printers come with an onboard vision system. This gives you the ability to print on top of food, as you saw, in addition to directly on top of the print bed, as traditional 3D printers and all other 3D food printers do. Now I'll play a second video for you.
So as you saw, our dessert decorator is also great at printing simple to complex icing pieces and decorating cookies. We chose a logo that takes 10 minutes by hand, uh, the chipmunk that you saw there. Our machine can print this design all day long at about four minutes per piece. We've done extensive testing in a variety of other applications as well, uh, with the top two being pizza and personalized nutrition. You may have heard of BHEX through our connection with NASA and our history of printing pizza. We catered events across the country during 2016 with our prototype. We won several awards and uh, most importantly though, we secured our seed funding from those efforts through Donato's Pizza. We've seen the best results when printing Neapolitan style pizza and cauliflower dough. Our work in personalized nutrition is with the Army. Much of it is secretive at this point, but essentially we take your DNA and convert it into machine code for food printing. Now our team, uh, Anjan is a professional engineer with an MBA, and he invented NASA's 3D food printing system. I'm a business attorney and entrepreneur. The majority of our team are engineers and a business analyst. The picture you see down to the right is our signatures on the inside of our machine to show that we stand behind and guarantee every machine that we sell. Just as important as our team, our investor is the founder of Donato's Pizza and Grody Company. We work closely with both companies on a day-to-day -day basis, which allows us to build on decades of experience in food production, engineering, and manufacturing. The U.S. Army is our R&D partner for personalized nutrition, and that's through the SBIR. Currently, we have six customers and strong interest from a large retailer. Funding from the Army, we just won a food science grant through the state of Ohio that we're starting next month, and our seed investor is committed to bridge round funding set to close this summer. Our competitive landscape is interesting. Food production is either done in a large food production facility with high volume, single function machines, or food is made fresh by hand. VHEX machines fit in the middle as a machine that can be used at either a production facility or in fresh food settings. Other 3D food printer companies, most based in Europe, focus on food design. They're small devices that print designs on flat surfaces. Uh, our customers consist mostly of bakery facilities, but the ideal spot for our machines is the in-store bakery department. Our business model is pretty straightforward. Our customers can purchase or lease machines. From there, we sell disposable frosting or icing pouches. Uh, if you're familiar, we can uh, fill them with any frosting or icing, such as Dawn's, Riches, CSM, et cetera. We also charge for design services and software after free initial use. All of this is supported by a quick ROI and a low total cost of ownership. That information is available upon request. My phone number and email are right here, so please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. As a final thought though, uh, get creative and let me know how 3D food printing could help make your ideas a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. That was great. I'm looking forward to my first 3D frosted cookie. Now, yeah, I don't think any them. emerging – oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, so I don't think any emerging technology pitch program would really be complete without a robot. And next up is just that, just maybe in an area you haven't really thought of for robots yet. I'd like to welcome Brian Hughes, VP of Sales and Business Development at BrainCorp. Brian. Thank you, Sterling. Appreciate uh, everything you've done to set this up and appreciate all the attendees uh, for getting on and uh, appreciate everyone's time. Uh, my name is Brian Hughes with Brain Corporation and I'll give you a little snapshot into what we do uh, from a software side for robotics. Uh, our mission statement is tomorrow's robots exist today. They're just being manual operated. Uh, so we focus on AI, machine learning, advanced computer vision systems for the next generation of self-driving vehicles. Uh, we launched in September of 2016. 
on an auto scrubber platform. Uh, and our business model is working with proven existing OEM platforms that already exist in retail and, and in grocery environments today. So a little snapshot of what we have available today, uh, and this just depends on the size of your space, but the 26-inch unit versus the 20-inch unit, just different size, obviously. Uh, the 20-inch unit works very well in grocery because of its maneuverability around wing stacks, aisle stacks, side stacks. Uh, anytime you've set up displays inside the store, uh, this smaller unit does a, does a real good job of maneuvering around that. Uh, we have a very simple approach to our technology. It's what we call dual mode, and it's simply manual or autonomous. So if in the middle of the day there happens to be a spill in the store, somebody could jump on that manually and, and get that up. Um, there's no, there's no uh, tools required uh, to make any adjustments on, on the unit. Uh, it's very simple programming to set up. Uh, it's a, what we call teach and learn. So somebody actually drives it, records a route, um, and then that route is saved uh, for future use. Uh, because we're collecting data, how long the machine is run, the square footage it can maintain, uh, we put all that information and store it in the cloud, and then we bring that back to our, our customers in a weekly snapshot. So every Thursday morning, we give them a weekly report of what that looks like uh, so they can manage the, off of those specific KPIs. And I've got a brief video of it actually operating so we can see how it maneuvers in the space. Um, our biggest asset is our software. And because we can object detection, our unit is designed to be in a real life environment where there's people, there's customers, there's moving pieces so that it can adapt to that space. And so the video will show a good snapshot of what that looks like, uh, how it maneuvers around that environment, uh, knowing that uh, a robot needs to be able to operate in a, in, in a real life function. And this, is, this video was actually a small grocery store uh, in Southern California. We are based in San Diego. Uh, so this operated in a small grocery store uh, in, our, in our area. So we've been able to adapt to the grocery environment space based on our ability to, to learn the environment. Uh, we rely on one time uh, by recording the route and then after that, uh, that route is stored. So what that means is if there was something changed in the environment, if there was some sort of shift in that space, you, would, uh, you wouldn't need brain corporation staff or engineers to come out. That could all be done at the site at the store level, so there's nothing needed for us to come back out re-engineer anything. It's just simply uh, changing new routes uh, because we know that space is ever-changing, especially in grocery. So if you look at the snapshot here, this just gives you an idea of what we've done to the actual units. So every seat, everything you see in black and gray is just a traditional manual machine as if you bought it just to drive it manually. Uh, as you see in the black and orange is where we've integrated uh, our LiDAR sensors, our 3D time of flight vision system, which allows us the unit to see as, as you and I see. So if somebody or something jumps in front of the unit, it can react the same way you or I would. Uh, and that's critical in an environment when you have unpredictable, uh, like children, uh, forklifts, things of that nature that jump in front of the unit that it can react and stop immediately. Uh, we created the user interface uh, based on janitor feedback. We actually went into the field knowing that that's an ever-changing position, so we needed something very simplified. Uh, so we took their feedback and actually created the user interface based on that feedback. So what does this mean, having a, an autonomous auto scrubber? So the, the advantages that it provides to our current customer base is reliable cleaning. Uh, the unit is there to do one task, and that is to scrub the floors day in and day out. Uh, improve employee safety because the unit runs at a specific methodical pace. 
Uh, it doesn't take risky turns and, and, and trailing water left behind that can become a slip and fall risk. Uh, we can allow in-depth reporting based on specific KPIs that we customize for each account um, that we can then give back that can be management tools uh, for each environment. Um, and then the ability to maximize efficiency and productivity. Uh, so you can just get more work done based on the amount of hours you already have. Because we're a software company, we don't make any of the hardware. This just gives you a brief snapshot of what we're looking at uh, both for the rest of 2018 and into 2019. So we have proven OEM partners that have been making the hardware for 50, 60 plus years. Uh, we adapt our software to those OEM partners to allow the autonomous solution. So that gives you a little bit about what we're doing on the floor care side, outside of floor care. Uh, because we're learning the space and our, our, our secret sauce is our inner navigation software, we can adapt that to anything inside the building. Uh, consumer robots, delivery robots, uh, retail shelf analytics, uh, mobility assisted robots, what we call people movers, and then of course security bots. Everything works off of our brain OS software, our platform. So when we look at converting a unit, uh, they would all work off of that same brain OS software so they can communicate. And then we can take that information and relay it back uh, through the, to the cloud and then put that back in, in, in specific metrics depending on the platform, whether it's a, a security bot, uh, a, a people move, or anything to that nature. We can provide back data report of what it's actually accomplished day in and day out. So this allows do more with less. The feedback we've gotten from our customers is the ability to uh, spend more time, uh, whether it's uh, attending to the restrooms, uh, interfacing with customers, uh, spending more uh, time away from just that mundane task of, of riding the machine around, uh, being able to free up that space and that time to do other tasks. And this just gives you a brief snapshot of what we've gotten back from responses as, as far as feedback. Uh, the one that's stuck out the most at the top is to reduce damage and extend product life. Uh, there's no, you know, our unit does not rub, touch, or, or make any contact, so therefore your shelving and your space is, is limited in the, in the impact that it would receive from a manually operated unit. Uh, it also extends, obviously, the life of the hardware because there's no contact being made on, on, the, on the unit itself. It's able to maneuver around the space without rubbing up against anything. So the expectation is that the life will uh, significantly increase uh, based on what we've seen in the past from manually operated units. Uh, we also you know, highly uh, train the, the staff. So we, we leverage that technology to increase the skill set at the store level. Uh, one of the biggest complaints we got in grocery as we were exploring this was if, there's, if they're short-staffed and they've got to uh, unload a truck, well, they're going to grab the, the floor operators, so therefore the floors don't get scrubbed. You know, in this case, that tool is there to just scrub the floors regardless of, of shortage of staff. And this gives a snapshot of some of the other platforms that we've also been exploring, uh, both floor care, inventory management, uh, e-commerce pick and pack, customer concierge security, uh, outdoor sweeping, which has been a big task for some of our retail customers, and then an assisted shopping cart tug that actually can bring freight from the back of the store to the front of the store. And then just kind of a snapshot, of a little bit about Brain Corporation. We were founded in 2009 by CEO Dr. Eugene Izakevich. We're at about 125 employees now. Uh, we are not a heavily sales staffed uh, organization. Uh, I have a VP of sales on the West Coast. I'm based on the East Coast, and then we report to an SVP of sales that also handles our OEM relationships. So the majority of our staff is marketing uh, and, and mostly scientists and engineers to, to continue to develop the AI, the, the, the autonomous navigation software. Um, first, up until August of last year, we were funded Series A and B strictly by Qualcomm. And then we got a cash infusion from SoftBank Vision Fund, which allows us to continue to do what we're doing and also to work uh, in parallel with a lot of the other portfolio venture companies that SoftBank Vision Fund has been involved with. So as I mentioned, our, our business model is to work with proven manufacturers, enabling them to provide robotic solutions, um, focusing on the next generation of AI and machine learning, uh, self-driving vehicles, our brain OS software, uh, can perceive environments, control motion, uh, picking up visual cues, and most importantly, picking up objects as they move throughout the store. 
Uh, and we are a subscription-based service, so it allows us to continue to drive software upgrades to the, to the unit. Uh, we've had four last year, uh, and this year alone we've already had three based on the increase of the amount of fleet that we have out in the field today. And that's it, and I just wanted to thank uh, Sterling and the team again for allowing us to participate, and I'm available for any questions for anybody that may have uh, some further, further discussion. That's great, Brian. Thank you. And thanks to all of our pitching companies today. Really appreciate your sharing with us, and a lot of really great points, right? A lot of learnings to take back to our business and think about how some of these tools are actually going to impact our business. And in doing that, we've got a whole bunch of questions. And again, if you have questions about any of the pitching companies here, you can just type them into that Q&A box, and I'll do my best to kind of moderate these things. So the first question I've got is for Audrey L. Now, what kind of e-commerce volume really justifies one of these vehicles? And like, what kind of ROI should somebody expect to see, or what kind of time frame? Sure. Um, so right now we recommend that you are doing or are close to doing about 45 deliveries a day. Uh, that can be out of one store. That can be out of a couple of stores in the same region. Um, but that's the number where it really, really makes sense. And there's other versions where let's say you're doing 20 deliveries a day but still really want to get started on this. We would work to you to figure out how to fill up the car with the other 20. So if you're doing 20, we would do you. And then we'd also find another uh, somebody probably not in your industry to be able to fill that car up. So don't let that stop you. Um, if you're not quite at that range. And then in terms of ROI, so right now we would work with you to do it pretty much at cost. Um, so compared to whatever delivery system you're using right now, there wouldn't be uh, much of any difference in, in your spend. Um, and when the price really starts to decrease, is probably in about uh, six to eight months after the launch because a lot of the areas map, we know your repeat customers, and we can take the safety driver out of the vehicle. And that pretty much cuts the cost in half because – uh, as many of you who work on the accounting side of things might know, uh, the driver actually makes up about 60% of the cost of last mile deliveries. Got it. Awesome. Just a, a quick note. I know we've got a bunch of people on the call here, and there's clicking through the slides. If we can just leave it on the last slide, that would be great. Thank you, guys. Um, so next up, uh, Marlo. On Pop Spots. Yeah. There, there's a lot of conversation around computer vision and attaching it to, to robots and different things moving around the store. How does a retailer really assess the quality of uh, a company's computer vision and how its uh, accuracy is going to be? Um, I mean, I think the, the biggest thing is just to see the results um, and how quickly you know they can get those results to you. Um, the the way our system works, and you know, we can turn around one of these fixtures pretty much immediately. So if we want to run an audit of the store, we put that in our system, and within about an hour, we've got the results sent out to the store managers, and they're moving on the floor with it. And of course, you know, just by looking at those PDFs that are printed out, you can immediately see, you know, is it doing what it's supposed to? You know, if I walk in lane two and it says Hershey's is supposed to be there, and it is, um, then you know maybe there's something off, but the results we've seen with, with our store managers is very positive. Um, we've had uh, really, really high accuracy, I mean, basically 100%, because, um, you know, we have uh, we also have just double-checking with people as needed um, if the system perceives accuracy to be lower. So uh, does that kind of answer your question? I think it does. And it, just a quick follow-on while we've got you here. How do you see this, or when do you see this being applied uh, to the rest of the store, at least as far as pop spots is concerned? Yeah, I mean, so it's something that we're already working on from an R&D standpoint. So, the, like I said, the displays are, are mini computers, and what we really focus on for the hardware development is that internal computer that sits inside the display. And we build it so that it can go in any size display or even without one. Um, really, we just need cameras and a Wi-Fi connection to be able to uh, check out of stocks. And so we're very, very interested in expanding the rest of the store. We're exploring it right now, and um, you know, we're happy to be happy to share more in you know, six months' time. Very cool. Thank you. Uh, ben, with BHAX, what kind of training does an employee need to use the system? 
Sure, it's a pretty simple um, process. So what you do is uh, you would load the frosting pouches, like I mentioned, uh, and connect it to the machine up top. And you can have a variety of colors. Um, and from there, you go through the software, which is just several steps, and you confirm that, yes, I put this color frosting and this in slot one, another one in slot two. You choose a design, and you say, for example, I'm, I'm printing on a, a quarter sheet cake. Choose uh, your design and um, run the vision system. So you would scan the cake after placing it on the print bed, and then you hit print. And uh, then when it's finished, you're ready to take it out and do the next one. It's as simple as that. Got it. Really easy, it sounds like. And just to confirm, all the frostings and everything are purchased through you, yes? Yeah, either us or our partners. It sort of depends on the, um, the our customer. You know, if they have a process in place, some people like to use the frosting and other ingredients that they've been using for a long time, and that's all fine. Our machine is compatible with everything. Got it. Great. And the last question will be for uh, you, Brian, and BrainCorp. With the vehicle, is it fully autonomous, or is it just driving a predefined route? So, good question. So, it... it it follows the route that you've trained. So we tell everyone you drive it one time and then that's it. Um, so to answer your question, it's fully autonomous once you've taught the route. After that, it, it runs on its own. Um, so if there's objects that are all of a sudden placed in the area where it was trained, it'll just maneuver around those objects. Got it. And do retailers need to buy new units or can they be retrofitted? Yeah, great question, and that's by far the most uh, I get asked. And right now, it's not plug-and-play yet. Uh, we are integrating this on brand-new technology. So what we've offered customers that, you know, are saying, hey, I, I'm, I'm three years into a five-year amortization schedule, we'll try to find solution providers out there that will buy back their fleet to make room for it because we know that, you know, you're kind of sometimes coming in in the middle of an amortization schedule. So we just don't want something like that to get in the way. We do have people out in the industry that will buy uh, existing fleet from, from companies. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. Now, thank you. that went so quick. That's about all the time we have for today. Um, so thank you all very much again for your time and your interest. And it's really been great being with all of you guys. And I want to thank, again, all of the companies pitching, all of our panelists that I know are on the line, and, of course, our, our sponsors as well. And I know everyone's probably sitting on the edge of their seats, right? Like, who, who won this thing? And we'll be announcing the winner during the last week of May once we have a chance to compile all the results, and it'll be a, a can't miss. We'll also be announcing the details of the fall 2018 event, so keep an eye out for that as well. Now, at the end of these talks, we always have a choice, right? We can walk out. Well, now we know a few more things. We have that knowledge. And awesome. I'd also say, well, we could take an action. We can reach out to some of these companies you heard from today, whether those pitching or the sponsors, and actually make a difference. To go from understanding that innovation gap we were talking about in the beginning to actually doing something about it. And I'd love to hear about it. So, again, I hope this has been of value and worth your time. Really looking forward to connecting with all of you as we move through the reinvention of retail together. Thanks, everyone.